Today, um, God has done a lot of things, but this word is profoundly important to the foundation of who we are. Who we are as a church and what God wants to do. And I have prophesied that the latter house would be greater than the former house. This new redemption that we've come into, I believe is a chance for me to atone for all my mistakes. And uh, I'm a little bit older, hopefully a little bit wiser than the first time I started. And uh, I thank all of you for being here, but you are not the building, you are the foundation. You are the building, you are the foundation from which God will build the building. Come on somebody, this, this is not the end of a thing, this is the beginning of a thing. And um, so I want you to roll with me when I talk about this. Um, nothing's wrong, I'm not tired from yesterday, nothing like that, but because of the subject matter, I'm gonna dial it back just a little bit. Uh, you may wanna take notes, you may wanna put these things in your phone and your iPad or however you do it. If you still take out and write in the margin of your Bible, that's fine. But I want you to really get this. I wanna talk about honor, the culture of the kingdom honor the culture of the kingdom. We live in a culture of disrespect. I don't have time to go into that, but cult disrespect is the culture of Jezebel. Oh, I wish I had time to break that one down. And that's a nasty, nasty spirit. Nasty spirit. We've lost our ability to honor. The political parties have lost their ability to honor each other. I was raised watching the Ronald Reagans and the Tip O'Neills, the Democratic Speaker of the House, and they were on polar opposite sides ideology, but they had massive respect for one another. That's gone. Last two presidential debates have been sickening to watch. All, all, respect, all honor gone. Well, somebody's got to recultivate that. And it starts in the house of God. Come on. Does somebody take responsibility to cultivate that? You don't honor people because they're honorable. That's objective. You honor people because that's your standard. Okay? I honored two drunk Clemson fans behind me yesterday. I wanted to throat punch somebody yesterday. I had to tell my son, don't throat punch somebody that was behind me yesterday, <clears throat> okay? But it's not whether or not the person is honorable. It's my standard. I'm gonna honor you because it's my standard whether you've lived a life worthy of it or not doesn't matter to me. It's my standard. So I want you to give me a few minutes to break this down. It's life changing. It's one of those messages that can change your life tomorrow if you'll execute it. So Father, give me profound insight today into your word, but I pray that you would let me communicate it in the most simplest way so everybody can walk out of here changed by the power and the word of God. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. Tell your neighbor on the right, here we go. Tell your neighbor on the left, this is gonna be good. Come on, say Here we go, this is gonna be good. Every sin is a sin of dishonor. There are 10 commands in the Bible. Four of them have to do with honoring God and six of them have to do with honoring people. Every sin you're dishonoring God, you're dishonoring someone, or you're dishonoring yourself. Every sin is a sin of dishonor. Every one of them. I'm, letting that, I'm, not, I'm not running out of things to say, I'm just letting that sink in. In fact, I got two pages of an outline here. When you talk about honor, the Bible is the seed for new territory. Everybody in this room, because you came here today, everybody online, you are being given the seed to leave here and take new territory. When you get word, you are getting the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You are giving the recipe for how to move into your next. 
Listening is the seed for learning. Okay? Knowledge is the seed for change. You cannot change without learning something new. Everybody's talking about tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. Tomorrow will be the same as today unless you learn something new. Because you cannot live above what you know. It's impossible. You will rise to your level of revelation. And what you don't know, you can't possess. Okay? Now, honor, stay with me. I'm going slow on purpose. Honor is the seed for access. You cannot access what you do not respect. I heard a preacher a while back, he said, all those doctors and all those lawyers, and I thought to myself, you know what he'll never have in his church? People disrespect wealth. Well, don't worry, you won't ever have it. Honor is the seed for access. You disrespect women, probably never be married. Or you won't be married long. <clears throat> I can see where you're going by what and who you honor. I don't have time now when I hire staff or when we do dream team to get to know everybody's character and view them for 20 years. So now you know what I do? I just watch who do they honor. How do they respond to greatness? How do they respond to weakness? How do they respond to pain? It is so quiet. This is good stuff. <laughs> because honor is the culture of the king. If we want kingdom things to happen in this building, there has to be honor one for another. Everything outside of those doors wants you and your brother on the same road to be divided. But something's got to happen inside of these doors that when we move outside of those doors, we show them something that they have never seen before because we're not going to let their arrows and their wedge divide who we know we are because we are a people of honor and we honor one another and I'm able to access your life because I honor you and you're able to access my life because you're honored to me. Whatever you honor, you have the ability to access. And your life will probably be determined by who you choose to honor. Is this all right, baby? Amen. Man, when she's been listening to my messages 32 years and she's saying that's so good, that's a good day, amen? <laughs> Can I keep going? <sighs> the proof of honor is adaptation. I honor my wife, so I have adapted to many things. <laughs> my wife honors her husband. She has adapted to many things. Esther soaked in oil for a year to adapt to a culture befitting a king. Joseph shaved his beard because Egyptians hated facial hair. What you honor, you're willing to adapt. Some of you, just the multiculturalism in this building, you've had to adapt just to be here. Because you honor the fact that heaven looks like this and is not all this or all that. You have broke away from another culture and you have adapted. All the songs may not be the kind of songs you like. All the songs may not have the cultural relevance that you do. But you don't care. Why? Because you're a part of a bigger culture and you've been willing to adapt and compromise because you honor what God is doing here and you believe in it. Am I all right in this place? A little more about honor. I'm going to Galatians chapter 4 in just a minute. Ooh, I can't open that. I got one there. I was like, ooh, if I open that, I'll be here a long, long time. 
Go to Galatians 4. 4 verse 1. Leave it on the screen if you would, guys. I'm going to come back and forth several times. I've preached out of this before, but never quite with the twist on it I've got today. Today is a, a, a new, I've, I've packaged an old pr uh, concept, principle, and a new message. <clears throat> Mark chapter 6. Some of you invited a friend. You said, man, he usually sweats and runs around and stuff. I don't know what's wrong with him. That nothing's wrong with me. <laughs> Jesus was cleaning out hospitals. The Bible says in one scripture that he healed all. All. Well, I want a church where everybody's healed. All that were sick and afflicted of the devil. Every, walked through the town and when he left the town, there were no cripple. There were no fever. There was no deaf, dumb, mute. None of it. There was no lepers. All. But then he gets to his hometown. <laughs> and nothing happens. Why? Because they said, this is Joseph's boy. Why are y'all Why are y'all acting like this? We know who this guy is. He's nothing special. We remember his mama changing his diapers and watched him grow up. He built benches with his daddy in his carpenter shop. Why are y'all getting all wound up about this guy? There's nothing special about him and he could do no mighty work there and he marveled at their unbelief. Now Jesus didn't finally end up in one town and all of a sudden there was no anointing in, on him in that town because it had nothing to do with him, it had to do with whether or not they honored him. Give me a little bit in these front fields, backing me up if you would please, Salman. It had to do not with Jesus, Jesus was anointed. Can I tell you something? If you don't have any honor for me today, there is no way I can bless you. If you're sitting back there saying, ah, I don't know about this Ron guy, ah, I can't help you. Because if there was an anointing on my life, and I sure hope there is, you wouldn't be able to access it because of disrespect. If you came up and God wanted to use you to bless you, to bless me, to encourage me, to just give me a word that would help me make it through the next week, and if I disrespect you, I cannot possess that word of encouragement that you've given me. I must honor you, the vessel, and I must honor the word that you bring. I can't help you if you don't honor me. Come on, somebody. I'm preaching real good. Okay? So Jesus went into his hometown and he could do no mighty work, not because he lost his anointing, but because his people didn't honor him as the son of God. So they didn't receive, not based on who he was, but based on how they saw him. The Bible says if you receive a prophet in the name of a prophet, you will receive a prophet's reward. Notice he put the onus on you if you receive. The if is not whether or not they're a prophet. The if is on how will you see them. And if you see them correctly, then the reward that is on their life has the ability to bless you. I am, I know I'm not sweating and screaming, but I'm telling you, this is powerful stuff. I can feel it even as I'm saying it. If you receive, the Bible says, if you receive a righteous man, in the name of a righteous man, you shall receive a righteous man's reward. In other words, if I, if I receive you as God's vessel and you bring some type of gift, some type of word, some type of prophecy, some type of encouragement, if I will acknowledge that you are God's vessel, then whatever the reward is will come on to my life because I acknowledged her. Do you see what I'm talking about? Look at your neighbor and say, I acknowledge that you are anointed. I want you to say that. I acknowledge that you are anointed. We've got to get to the place that we understand anointing is not just on a stage. Anointing is not just with the microphone. How many miracles have we missed 
because God used somebody normal, God used somebody that we didn't esteem highly to bring us something and we missed what God had because we did not receive them properly. Somebody shout amen if you want a kingdom culture in this place. Shout hallelujah. Bless his holy name. Bless his holy name. Amen. I promise you I'm not anal about sound, but if you don't give me more right here, I'm going to lose my voice. I have to hear myself or I'm going to lose my voice. <coughs> there you go. I hear it now. There we go. <coughs> Galatians 4 verse 1. How long have I been preaching? Am I all right? That was my introduction. That's why I'm asking. <laughs> Let me go back and deal with this. I usually preach this in another setting. This plays right into growth track. This plays right in to our dream team. We don't just do stuff to do it. Everything we do has purpose. Everything. I don't have time. I don't have energy to pour myself into things that have no purpose. Our growth track is designed for three things. Number one, let you discover who God and who we are as a church. Number two, let you discover who you are and the gifts that you possess. And number three, marry those things. Because the way you flourish is just to get you in the right place. It's almost effortless if you just get in the right place. That's what that's about. What is the dream team? I'm gonna show you. It's why we serve. I say that the heir as long as he's a child, does not differ at all from a slave. Boy, that's tough wording. I say that the heir, as long as he's a child. What is an heir? An heir is the root word of an in heir a tense. Okay? An inheritance is a prearranged blessing to be released at a specific time of maturity. If I could get one amen from the back. A prearranged blessing to be released at a specific time of maturity. So I say that the one who has a prearranged blessing to be released to them at a specific time of maturity, as long as he is immature, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all. Condition and position. Positionally, he owns all the billion dollar empire of his father. But conditionally, he can be living under a bridge because he is not yet of age. So you can have a billion dollar dynasty that is to be released to you at age 30 and you can be 29 and be homeless although you own the whole thing positionally. Conditionally, you have not met the requirement to possess it. There are people where God has prearranged blessings. Come on, somebody, I'm gonna preach this thing. Prearranged blessings to be released at specific times of maturity, but we cannot come into them because we are locked in a way of immature thinking. We're locked in immature talking. We're locked in immature how easily we get offended. Y'all ain't saying nothing. We're locked in immaturity how we let other people manipulate us. We're locked in immature relationships. We're locked in immature ways we handle our money we're locked in all this immaturity and we can't possess it although we're the heir of all of it is this okay shout amen, amen. you are preaching good Ron Carpenter <coughs> but let's go to verse 2 but is under guardians and stewards oh oh because this generation ain't under nobody My mama don't even tell me what to do. And that's why your life looks like it looks right now too. <laughs> that is not a comment to be proud of. But is under guardians and stewards. So in other words, God will lock your inheritance up in other people. And if you know how to honor 
you'll get the room. I'm going over here. I'm going to come back. I didn't get a lot of love over there, so I'm going to go over here and come back. If you honor the person that God has locked your inheritance up in, then that will release the reward to come back and touch your life. I'm not talking about harvest. Harvest is something that comes and goes, comes and goes. That's why you gotta keep sowing seed every Sunday. That's why you gotta keep sowing it every day, why? Because harvest is cyclical. It comes and it goes, it is seasonal. And for everything under heaven, there is a time and there is a season, it comes and goes. But now for your inheritance, it does not come and go, it is a blessing that comes to stay. Because inheritance has nothing to do with seed and time and harvest. Inheritance has to do with who's your daddy. I want to ask y'all, who's your daddy? Do you have a heavenly father? Come on, who cares for the widows and the orphans? Do you have a heavenly father that is a father to the fatherless? I don't know what your earthly father is like, but anybody in here that's got a heavenly father that loves to give good gifts to his children, I need you to take 10 seconds and give the Lord your God a praise because your heavenly father... Ah! Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. Six, five, four, three, two. Shout hallelujah! High five three people say he's my father. He's my father. He's my father. Come on. High five them. He's my father. Hallelujah. Yay. Mm. Hallelujah. 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 Colossians 3. So what did I start off in my introduction? Honor is the seed for access. You receive someone in the name of that which they are, then you will receive the reward that God has on their life for you. I cannot receive from anything and anyone I disrespect. Okay? Now, we have an inheritance God has locked it up in other people and how we honor those other people will determine whether that inheritance breaks open in our life or not. That's why we have got to kill dead this culture of disrespect we're living in. I don't care what they do, don't you let it have you. <clears throat> they wanna get on Twitter and act a fool, you let them get on Twitter and act a fool. You don't do that because you're not of that. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward. Wait a minute, wait a minute. An inheritance is a prearranged blessing to be released at a specific time of maturity. Go back to verse 23. So whatever I'm doing, I need to do it with all my might. And while I'm doing it, Verse 24, I do it knowing that I'm breaking open my inheritance. So God has locked your inheritance up in other people and when you serve them, <laughs> is anybody in... Uh, Is this all right, Pastor Dwayne? Am I doing all right? You taking notes because you're going to preach this at the RF meeting. I know what you're going to do. <laughs> put that put verse back up there if you would again. Verse 24. Verse 24. Knowing. So I'm doing something uninspired. I come to church. I go to the dream team meeting. And they tell me that three people have called in at the last minute and can't be here. So they turn around and they say, Pastor Pastor Robert, could you go and help us in the nursery? Nursery? Wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm a prophet. <laughs> Prophets don't do nursery. Okay. Well, your inheritance has just been held up a little bit longer. Whatever, whatever, 
if you have been assigned to make sure there is no wet toilet paper on the bathroom floor, you're doing an uninspiring task. So what keeps you inspired? Knowing that while you are doing it, you're not doing it for people. Woo! Hallelujah. But you're doing it as unto the Lord. Knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. So yes, ma'am, I'll go back here and make sure that we got this bathroom clean. Why? Because the eyes of the Lord are looking to and fro into the earth. And I want him to see me being diligent with the energy and time he's given me. And I'm going to make sure this is the nicest bathroom in the history of Christianity. I'm going to make sure this is the cleanest place in the history of the... I feel like running around this building because when I know that I'm doing something and God is watching, that is all the inspiration I need. Hallelujah! Can I go a little bit deeper? I know what time it is, but can I go deeper? <laughs> Link your neighbor say, give him seven more minutes. So my inspiration is not coming from the task. All kingdom tasks are not inspirational. The people who come every Sunday and set this up and tear it down, I have helped them do that. It is not inspirational. But I'm not doing it for you. I'm doing it for God. Remember, if you do it for people, you won't do it well, and you won't do it long. Let me tell you how long you'll do it. You'll do it until you find something out about the leader you don't like. <laughs> and as soon as you find a kink in their armor or a, a flaw in their character, your diligence will diminish. If you have found that working in you, you are already doing it for the wrong eyes. The Bible says we do nothing for man pleasing, but we do everything in the sight of the Lord. Come on, somebody. So what I do when it's visible and what I do when nobody's looking, I draw my inspiration knowing that my next level of submission and my next level of diligence and honoring what God has put in front of me to do is breaking open my next blessing that has been held up for me in heaven. I don't know what the blessing is, don't even care. I just wanna keep them rolling in, amen, by being faithful with everything God has given me to do. I know this is hard on some of you, I can tell by the look on your face, but if you'll hear the word of the Lord today and receive me as a prophet, you'll get a prophet's reward before you leave this building. Come on, somebody. I told you seven minutes. Give me five. I'm not going to read these last scriptures for the sake of time. I'm just going to quote them, let the people read them. So in other words, in, other to re in order to receive you properly, you've heard this, me talked about it with the pastors in RF all the time. I have to perceive you properly. I can't get what's on your life if my perspective of you is not right. <laughs> okay? Oh, that preacher man, he's just a jack leg fake. He's a chameleon. Okay? You're entitled to that, but I, now, now I can't help you. I can't do anything for you. Because it's not based on what I am. It's based on how you see me. You say, you got to prove that to me, Pastor. Jesus was the woman at the well. He said, may I have something to drink? And here she went. She didn't care much for men. She didn't have a high value of men at all. And she kept coming to this well over and over. So Jesus said, I must go to Samaria, even though it was out of the way. And he had this encounter with this woman at the well. And he said, may I have something to drink? Can I tell you why I believe Jesus said that? I don't believe he was setting her up. I believe he was thirsty. I believe Jesus was led by the Spirit just like us. I believe he got there and he rolls with it as it's coming. Yeah. Yeah. So he sits there and she says, well, the well is deep and you have nothing to draw with. Well, you Jews don't even talk to us Samaritans unless you need something. Well, I wish you'd tell me where this living water is and so I don't ever have to. I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. 
And Jesus is just sitting there tired. <laughs> just want some water. It's like, hey, woman, I just want some water. Jesus realizes he's getting nowhere because she sees him as a Jew. Go call your husband. Ooh. Um, uh, I don't have a husband. Jesus said, you've answered correctly. You've had five. And this one that you have now, you shacking. So you're in your sixth. So what is Jesus basically saying? I hope you like coming to this well. Because if you don't change the water you drink, and you're going to come back here for the rest of your life. You're moving from man to man to man to man because there's a hole in your bucket and you can't carry anything inside of you. You are empty, you are deficient, and you go from relationship to relationship and you suck the life out of them and then you move on to the next one. And Jesus said, if you knew who you was talking to, you would ask him for water and you would never thirst again. I want to drink water that makes me never thirst again and plugs the hole in my bucket and fills up my soul. Anybody want to drink from that well? When Jesus told her this, look at the shift. She said, sir, I perceive thou art a prophet. Going down to verse 42 to 46, somewhere down there. And the Bible says, she ran all throughout the town. So Jesus' first ordained minister was a woman at the well. For those of you who don't like women, preachers. <laughs> she ran all over town preaching. Saying, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. In other words, he must have sat there and prophesied to her. But he couldn't prophesy to her till he shifted her perception. As long as he was a Jew, he couldn't help her. But when he became the son of God, he can change your life. His anointing didn't change the way she saw him changed. Such is the honor code of the kingdom. The problem in the kingdom is we've been taught to honor that not understanding that the anointing yeah. is right here. <laughs> so everybody in the room probably expected to receive something from me today. But did you expect to receive anything from the person when you're walking out the door? From the conversation in the parking lot. Because the anointing is corporate. It's not individual. The anointing is upon the whole. Ah! Man, this is good. I told him back in the back when I prayed this morning, I said, the wine is not in the individual grape, it's in the cluster. Yes, sir. We know that the Song of Solomon depicts Jesus in the church. And when the groom looked at his bride, he talked about this part and this part and this part, and some of it was X-rated. I'll be honest with you, this part and this part. But when he got through, he said, Phew. he said, you are all together lovely. In other words, you have many aspects of you that are dashing. He said, but when I look at the package, whoo, you are all together loved. Let me tell you something. We individually are all attractive to God, but when we get together, turn to your neighbor and say, I want you to know I'm real pretty right now. Come on, I'm real pretty right now. <laughs> Yo, I'm hurrying. I know we've been here a while, but just hold on. Just hold on, okay? That food's gonna be there. I'll get you to the buffet while they got it under that heat lamp and the food's got a little glaze over the top of it. Yep, <clears throat> yep. Y'all ought to be living off Thursday's fat gram still today. You shouldn't even be hungry. <clears throat> the principle of representation is key to the kingdom. Jesus said when you've done it to the least of these, that's me. So when we're passing out those rice and beans in the streets of the Dominican Republic 
and I've been there and I've passed them out. It's Jesus, 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 because he's represented in the least. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He is represented in me. The Bible tells me if I've seen you, I've seen Jesus. What is the tithe? You know what the tithe is? Representation. That's why the tithe is 10 and not 8, not 6%, not, not 11, it's 10%. Because in our numeric system, we can't count higher than 10. If you can count the 10, you can count the 600 billion. Just get the 10 and start over. So the highest you can go is 10. So God says, bring me the 10 and I will bless the whole. Because the 10 represents God. I got four people got that one. I'll, I'll have to work on that one later. Do you see what? Do you see the principle there at work? Okay. Why were you born into sin? Because Adam represented you. How did you get saved? You didn't die on the cross. Jesus died on the cross and he represented you. He became sin for you. The principle of representation saved you. And if we don't learn how to serve each other, if we don't learn how to honor each other, I don't care how bad it offends you, you hold to your standard. You do not stoop and, be, and respond to what they just did or what they just said. You keep your high standard. I've had people say horrific things about me. And you know what I do? Keep my standard. I can't control what you think about me, but I can control what I think about you. I can't control what you say about me, but I can control what I say about you. And God will not honor you because they honored you. He will honor you because you honored and you kept your standard no matter what anybody else did. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. I'm reading this and I'm quitting. I promise I'm quitting. Hallelujah. 2 Corinthians 5, or is it 5, 17 and 18 I think I gave you guys? For the love of Christ compels us. Say compel. You're being pushed from behind. Because we judge thus. He said, this is how I view people. Because of the love of Jesus, this is my perspective. That if one died, all died. So now when I look at you, because of the love of Jesus that has touched me, this is my perspective. Everything I don't like you about you died when Jesus died. This is one of the most challenging verses in the whole Bible. Next verse. And if he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Next verse. From now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Play something if you would for me, DJ. Do you know how hard that is? So now I no longer see Robert coming toward me. I got to receive him in the name of the Lord. Blessed is he who comes in his name. Uh, in the name of the Lord. I can't just bless the Lord. I got to bless who comes in his name. Now when I see you walking toward me, there may be something in you that if I honor, it's unlocked for me. Did you see the first verse I read? It's locked up in somebody else. So if you never learn how to honor anybody else, you don't access it because honor is the seed for access. You got doors you want to walk into, you're going to have to honor who's behind the door. You got opportunities you want, you're going to have to honor who is the Lord of the opportunity. Everybody hates your supervisor, you need to be the one that honors them. Oh, that went over like cinder blocks were tied to the bottom of it. I'm bringing this thing down to where we live. 
this is the way you don't just change the culture of a church. You can change the culture of a society. But it starts in the house of God. <clears throat> you know, your West Coast brothers and sisters, you know that is not a churchy area. And I'm being kind. Okay. But it never ceases. The way I go in and treat people. Who are you? Nobody talks to us like that. When they look at the tip, they look up at me confused. Follow me out the door talking to me. They didn't even do a good job. Oh, I'm not giving them nothing. They stunk. Not here. In fact, when they really are terrible, sometimes I double bless them. When you honor the unhonorable, it change. Let me tell you something. It changes people. It changes people. I preached uh, for Pastor Parsley a while back at his 30th anniversary of a, a Dominion camp meeting and I was in Cleveland before I went to Columbus and I needed a haircut. I just needed a haircut. And I went to a, I didn't know the people, I don't usually do that, I might just walked in blindly because I needed a haircut. And the girl was there and her boyfriend had just been murdered four days before I about got there. Murdered. Okay. Excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. That was somebody else. This girl's sister was murdered four days and she had his son. Keep raising. Now, here she was, young hairstylist. You could, tell she, you could tell she was a party girl. You could just tell it. You could tell she was a wild child. And now she's got this kid. And she's sitting there and she's pouting. So I asked her, I said, what's wrong? She tells me, I said, and she said, I went and sold out a medium. So I'm going and seeking psychics to try to figure out what am I going to do. And I said, I'm a Christian. I said, can I pray for you? And I got up out of that chair and I laid hands on her head and I started praying. And that girl started trembling in the presence of God. I broke the power right there in that salon of the evil spirit she had opened herself up to. My haircut was $40 and I gave her a $200 tip. She followed me all the way out to the car. What's the name of your church? Where do you preach again? Tell me about the website and everything. And I've already got news that she's been in our iChurch setting. Come on, somebody. A girl who was seeking a psychic. Why? Because it doesn't matter who they are. My standard is honor. Stand on your feet with me all over this building. Hallelujah. Tell five people, say, I honor you today. Come on. I honor you today. I honor you today. In the name of Jesus, I honor you. Listen to me. The first time I started Redemption was in a little warehouse with 11 people. And I would sit there and tell those people, God's called you to be a gatekeeper church. Well, that looked ridiculous. Now I'm sitting in here in a leased building telling about 800 to 1,000 people, God has called you to be a gatekeeper church. It should be a lot easier to believe. But God does not turn the eyes of the people to a particular church because they outdo them with the music and they build a better facility. There's something that's happening in the people and in the building that is unmatched. And what I've taught you today is what creates that. I want you to take these scriptures and go home and read them and regurgitate them and challenge yourself that you will become a person of honor, not just in church. It's easy to do it in here but carry it out there and change your world. Let's praise him one more time. May the Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you, establish you and give you peace. I love you with all my heart. Go have the best Sunday you've ever had in your life. God bless you. Be here next Sunday for the next word.